Oh yeah, that's what I'm torquing about. Get it? All the torque. Hey crew, I've got the key to that 24 Land Rover Range Rover Velar. We are going to take it for a drive, but first, let's check it out looks on the inside and outside. For the 24 model year, the Velar gets a mild styling refresh with a new grille insert beneath the same Range Rover spelled out and elevated on the hood. There are projector LED headlights with LED DRLs and turn signals. Above thin LED fog lights. For 24, all the exterior trim has been darkened. You still get that jutting front splitter and gloss black. This one is painted in Zadar Gray Metallic. It's a $1,500 paint option and looks excellent with the Velar's sleek exterior design. At the side, the Velar as standard gets 19 inch wheels, but this one is optional 21 inches with a diamond cut finish. They're wrapped in Michelin Latitude all season tires, size 265 section front and rear. The profile shows off several straight lines at a slight upward angle to them. And I really like those wheels, especially the fact that they still have some tire sidewall to them. This one is the optional gloss black contrasting roof. And here at the back, you can really see that visual separation between the upper and lower portions of the body. There's just sort of a shelf that comes around the entire exterior. The taillights are thin with LED turn signals. Down low is a slightly reworked bumper for 24, here blacked out, and the tailpipes are hidden up underneath. The rear view is interesting because the bumper kind of comes in to expose some of the rear tire, which I like, I think it looks futuristic. The overall Velar design though, it really relies on a good set of large wheels because I've seen this vehicle on smaller and less attractive wheels and it just doesn't work for me. My question for you is whether you like the roundedness of the new Range Rovers. Let me know in the comments and let's check out the interior. Opening up with these door handles that pop out when unlocked and flush them out when locked. And looking inside at this two-tone grained leather interior of ebony on cloud with seat perforations and rear seat heating with the cold climate package. On the doors, there's this rubberized material up top, leatherette, ash wood trim, more of that rubberized padding for your arm, not much padding though, hard plastics down low. There is a Meridian 400 watt sound system with this dynamic SE trim, one touch up down windows, stepping in, ducking my head ever so slightly, behind my own seat at six feet tall. I've got plenty of knee room. There is more of that rubberized material, map pocket, and good sized foot pockets to slide my feet under, meaning thigh support is solid. And headroom is as well. Head easily clears the roof. That gets the thumbs up from me. In the middle, we've got air vents. You've got your seat heat settings, two USB-C ports, and a DC outlet. The drive shaft hump is pronounced, but it's got a wide enough opening to slide my leg over and get into the middle seat, where my head once again clears underneath the standard panoramic sunroof. Unfortunately, it does force my legs pretty wide into the space of what would be fellow passengers. If you don't have a middle passenger, then the armrest drops down with two cup holders and leather padding. Let's check out the front next. Before we listen to the door close noise, check out this cool Velar silhouette on the B pillar. That is a well built sounding FUD. Smart keyless entry is for both the rear and front doors. With that cold climate package, the front seats are both heated and ventilated with multi-way power adjustments, including lumbar and three positions of memory for the driver's seat. There's an aluminum Range Rover tread plate, aluminum accented foot pedals, and I have to mention that these floor mats really do suck. They don't want to stay on the pegs. They're constantly shifting around when you get in and out of the vehicle. The front doors look just like the back. They add power adjusting and power folding door mirrors. Here is your lift back release. And behind that second row, we're gonna find 30 cubic feet of space. It does fold the seats 40, 20, 40. And with them down, you've got a best in class 60 cubic feet. I just wish you could fold the seats easier than reaching your arm all the way over there to release the latches or opening the rear doors to do so. Underneath the floor is an almost full size spare tire. The tailgate has a power close function, not power lock. 
sliding into the driver's seat now and closing that door. And finding a heated two-tone leather wrapped steering wheel that feels so luxurious in the hands. With leather topping the airbag cover, touch icons on the wheels, some of which are interactive, but are not as intuitive as physical controls. I do love the large aluminum paddles in the back of the wheel. The wheel tilt and telescope is power. There is a digital gauge cluster that is reconfigurable. A head-up display is an option. Injection molding up high in the dashboard, and then here is more of that rubberized material. New for 2024 is the latest from Land Rover, their 11.4 inch touchscreen infotainment system with the Pivi Pro software that takes a little while to get used to and I wish the climate functions were always displayed. Still, it's visually gorgeous and quite responsive with wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. Beneath the screen is a very minimalist approach to console design with the gear selector looking like it's an island on wood waters, at least until you press here to find a wireless charging pad with a USB-C port. Honestly, this whole look is very similar to Tesla's, and I don't mean that favorably. The cup holders are always exposed because you can slide these forward and backward as armrests or open them up to find not very much storage with a USB-C and USB-A port. Oh, and in case you're curious, these are rubberized as well. Visibility does have a blind spot at that D-pillar, but you do have standard blind spot monitoring with rear cross traffic. This cabin certainly does feel very chic and luxurious, with the tech upgrade for 24 helping that impression and making the $80,500 as tested price more palatable. Now let's take the Velar for a drive. All right, let's fire it up. Just a small jolt from the turbo inline six on startup, followed by a few relatively pleasant chimes. Hello, cabin crew. Thank you for joining me for this drive in the 24 Land Rover Range Rover Velar, which means hidden or disguised in Latin. And that gels with this very minimalist cabin and the fact that while staring at the steering wheel, you can't even see the start stop button. It's kind of hidden behind the windshield wiper stock. You gotta duck your head over and then find that button. Our drive modes, we have some on-road modes and off-road modes. You find those by hitting the mode button here on the screen, there, and then you can choose from on-road, eco, comfort, or dynamic, and off-road with the terrain response system, you have comfort, grass, gravel, snow, mud or ruts, or sand. We're not gonna dabble with these today because I wanted to get at the heart of the Velar buyer and how they're going to use this vehicle most often on the road. So back to the road modes. Let's start in comfort and then clicking back on the gear selector and then pushing it forward. That engages reverse and an ultra high resolution backup camera. That might be the sharpest res screen I've seen from one of these systems. And you do have trajectory lines. Surprising to me is that you don't have a surround view camera as standard on this dynamic SE grade that as tested is $80,500. You do have parking sensors, but no surround view. Weird. Backing it up now. Checking the mirrors as well. Now, clicking down into drive, and away we go. Let's kick things off with the world famous horn test. Mm. That's, a, that's a good, solid horn sound. And for the turn signal sound. Oh my. Can a turn signal relax you? I don't think it's possible, but if it could, this would be as close to that sound as possible. Powertrains in the Velar, take your pick. The entry level P250 uses a turbocharged 2.0 liter four cylinder to make 247 horsepower, or this P400 has a 3.0 liter turbo inline six cylinder that makes 395 horsepower and 405 pound feet of torque. Either way, it is routed through an eight speed torque converter automatic and sent through all four tires via a permanent all wheel drive system. And here in the comfort drive mode, throttle response is never dull. It's always just rearing to go and the boost builds quickly. You can easily get up to speed 
But if you don't want extra urgency from your throttle response, you can go into the eco drive mode, which restrains it ever so slightly. Still, I mean, if you give it a little extra, it's gonna pick up the pace such that I think there could be like an eco plus mode or even having this eco mode be a little more aggressive with the dulling of the response because that matches the, the Range Rover vibe a bit more in my opinion, the, the relaxation you're supposed to have behind the wheel. Obviously you want power, but that's what full throttle is for. Here, I just want to be relaxed. I do love the forward visibility out of this large windshield to take in scenery like this, the waves crashing against the coast. The transmission is smooth in the gear changes at speed, but under two conditions, it's not really all that smooth. It's a bit clunky, almost like a dual clutch transmission. And that is when the start stop system is engaged, which to turn that off, you have to go here, hit settings, and then hit the start stop button. I wish it was a physical button or just a single tap on the main screen. But when that is engaged and it reignites the engine, it then has to go into first gear. And if you're in a hurry at a stoplight, you're like, it's green, I gotta go. Then there's a jolt that happens as it engages first gear. The other time it's not so smooth is under the braking. I really can discern those gear changes there and the brakes themselves aren't the most gentle in your slowing. I do love this auto brake hold function, so if I'm sitting in a light for a long time, or in this case, I want to turn around and there's a lot of cars here, I can take my foot off the brake and it's not going to roll forward on me, it's just going to sit pleasantly. And finally we have a brake in traffic so I can try out the turning radius, which is spectacular. And without the help of a rear wheel steering system, that's just a, that's a good old fashioned turning radius. And that's the wrong accent for Range Rover. Speaking of Range Rover things, I think about ride compliance in Rovers. And here with the adaptive dampers, the body's contained from heavy lateral motions. The adaptive dampers do filter out the worst of the road imperfections. But you know what? There's a little bit of a busyness to this ride that isn't out of alignment for the segment, but for a Range Rover. You see that badge and you think, just relaxation everywhere. There's just a little bit too much body motion going on over what appears to be a very well-paved, okay, except for this section that's under construction, a pretty well-paved section of road. But now we need to see how quick the Velar P400 gets to 60 with a real-world 0-60 to 60 test. I've got my race box set up here to record. I'm going to go into the dynamic drive mode, then pull back on the gear selector to engage the sport powertrain response. I've got the auto brake hold disengaged, but I am going to brake boost it off the line to see how we do. Here goes. Holding, building, letting go. Quick getaway to 60 and 6.12 seconds. That's respectable. And here in the mid range. Oh yeah, that's what I'm torquing about. Get it? All the torque. Potent for passing. I'm just gonna keep going, but it's fast. Even on an uphill, this thing hustles. And now I am tempted by these large, luscious aluminum paddles. I'm tempted to use manual mode. And while there isn't a manual mode per se that you can lock into, just by pulling on the paddle, it does engage that, allow you to shift for yourself, ooh, and let you hold it all the way out to redline. I was not expecting that in this rover. Keeping it, keeping it, keeping it, pulling it, shifting quick. I, I don't even mind the sound of the engine. I wish there was more turbo compressor noise, but this I-6. Sounds hearty. I mean, honestly, just really astonished that it doesn't upshift for me. And pleased, very, very pleased with that. 
the promptness of the shift response as you pull the paddle, the feel of these paddles, and the response from that engine. It's very good. But speed is merely a single dimension of performance. I'm obliged to also evaluate the Velar's braking and handling. So still in the dynamic mode, still in the sport powertrain mode, unfortunately there's no way to turn off traction or stability control, so we'll have to see how invasive those are here as we go full ABS and chuck it into a curve. All right, carrying speed, stabbing those brakes. Ooh, the stop was a little long for me, but the body stayed flat. Nice turn in, wants to understeer. You can tap the brakes to bring the nose back in. And the brake-based torque vectoring is helping us out. Does cut power a little bit, but not nearly as much as I thought. And we do scoot out the back end. Let's go for round two here. There, it's cutting power. And finally letting us go. And go quick at that. In perfect candor, my expectations for braking and handling from the Velar were very low and it did exceed those. Now, in some regards, in others, they're right about what I expected. I take it out of sport, go into drive and comfort here as I kind of put my thoughts together. So the braking, you did have that initial bite, which I was looking for, but then it carried us deeper into the curve than I would have liked at the speeds that we were. The turn in was nice and sharp and the feeling of stability through the curve was excellent. I liked especially, this is what I wasn't anticipating, that you could play around with the rotation of the Velar mid-corner. I could use the brake pedal to tuck the nose back in and then getting quicker on the throttle I could bring the tail end around and rotate slightly. The problem was that you can't turn off stability or traction control. So it was cutting power when I was getting back on throttle hoping to then carry that rotation in to corner exit. You do have brake-based torque vectoring, so it could then redistribute and kind of utilize the power as well as possible, but the fact that you could not fully take control over that corner was sort of a bummer. And then there's the fact that I was just slopping all over the seat because while these chairs are supremely comfortable around town with the right amount of padding, they do not have the bolsters for the lateral support that you need when carrying speed like that through the curve. Now, as we are on the highway, it seems like the perfect time for me to zip it so we can listen for the NVH level at these speeds. This cabin quiet does really earn that Range Rover badge. And the installed active noise cancellation system for 24 is working to quell the wind, tire, and road noise considerably so that I could have quiet conversations with my fellow passengers. As far as commuting, the Velar Dynamic SE Gray does come as standard with adaptive cruise control and steering assistance. I'll test that out now. See what plots the curve in the road. Ooh. There was a lot of side to side motion. And it seems to struggle to stay in the center of the lane. Now, this is not supposed to be a hands free system, it's just supposed to help you. But if its version of help is jamming you side to side in the lane, then I, I don't want that help. It's time now for the miles per hour word of the day, which for the 24 Land Rover Range Rover Velar is modish, meaning stylish or fashionable. Because the Velar, above all else, is about the look and the feel. It's about arriving at your destination and folks taking notice. And indeed, the Velar is Quite chic. Chic does come at a cost though. I'll share that with you in just a moment. First, the top speed and fuel economy. Top speed for the P400 grade of the Velar is 155 miles per hour. The fuel economy is 19 MPG in the city, 25 on the highway, and 21 combined. Though over the last 43 miles or so, we've been averaging 
12 miles per gallon. The starting figure for the P250 version of the Velar is $63,000. That is a floating Prius, not using its signals. What are you doing? And the starting price for the P400 grade we're driving here is $73,000. Though this one as tested, they really need to get off their phone. Though this one as tested is 80,500 buckaroos. Competitors for the Velar P400 grade include the BMW X3 M40i that starts at $63,000, makes 382 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.4 seconds, has a top speed of 155 miles per hour, and fuel economy of 25 combined. There's also the Porsche Macan S that's also $63,000. It makes 375 horsepower, gets to 60 in 3.9 seconds, has a top speed of 160 miles per hour and fuel economy of 19 combined. And then we've got the Genesis GV70 3.5 T that starts at $59,000. It makes 375 horsepower, gets to 60 in 4.9 seconds, has a top speed of 150 miles per hour and fuel economy of 21 combined. Which means the Velar is the most expensive to start, but it does make the most power and not seen on those spec sheets is the fact that it does have the greatest cabin and passenger volume. Oh, and then beyond that, as I said, if style is your main goal, then you can't really beat this thing. Provided you choose the right wheels and you're on board with cabin minimalism. In fact, I think there's only one thing in which Land Rover slightly missed the mark on this vehicle, and that is ultimate ride compliance. Because though the Velar is right in line with competitors in that regard, it doesn't exceed them, which I think it should with a Range Rover badge. And of course, if you're me and you favor driving dynamics above all else, you'll sidestep the Velar, you'll save a bit of money, and you'll go get either the BMW X3 M40i or the Porsche Macan S, which are superior driving products. Which would you guys choose though? Would you have this Land Rover, Range Rover, Velar, P400? Would you get the Porsche Macan S, the BMW X3 M40i, the Genesis GV70 3.5T, or another small premium performance SUV that I did not yet mention? Let me know in the comments, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this POV drive review. If you did, please like, comment, and share it. Subscribe to the channel, hit that bell to get notified, and I'll see you again next time.